You guys know you're blessed when Steve is here leading the singing instead of me. <laughs> I heard that. Amen to that. All right, so guys. I've got a question. What is sin? What is sin? You know, in this world, it can, we can start slipping into a different question, and we think we're still answering the question of what is sin, and that question is, well, what's right and what is wrong? It starts getting to be a pretty slippery slope. Because now you start, if you're going to decide, well, if, if, if the definition is what is right and what is wrong, well, who is the judge? Because I'm pretty sure we could go around this room and if we ask enough questions, we might answer that differently, every single one of us, on what is right and what is wrong. Fundamentally, you know, we're learning this week, as these people did back in the time of this, what happened, Sin is not just what is right and wrong, and certainly, thankfully, it's not us humans. We're fickle, we change, we're moody, we're different. We're not the judges. Of course, God is the judge. And what sin is, then, ultimately, it's rebellion against God. It's defying God's word. It's black and white. And thankfully, it is. If it was gray, we'd all be in trouble. And of course, that matters when we are wrestling with what we see in the lesson this week, and that is God's wrath against sin. God loves His people, we know that, but we also see God hates sin, and God punishes sin. And so we see this week when we're, when we're saying, wow, you know, they wiped out a whole city, a whole people. Every man, woman, child, and animal in the place. Uh, and that's tough, you know. And, and incidentally, just starting off at the beginning of this, it's, it's, it's okay. And in fact, you know, somebody said Saturday morning, it's really, it's almost necessary that we struggle with it. And certainly we all, at some point, hopefully, we come to terms with God is God, we're not. Sin is rebellion against God. And if it's rebelling against God... There will be a punishment. It will be judged by God. But thankfully, too, we see God warns us about sin. He doesn't punish sin without warning before it happens. It's not one of those things where, well, I don't know the rules and I was guilty and I'm ignorant of the law and the law is not published anywhere. And if I'd have only known, I wouldn't have done it. But, you know, it's not that way. Thankfully, God's very clear. He gives us this word, and we're thankful for His word that warns against sin. And, of course, there's a pattern God warns us. We sin anyway. And there's got to be a judgment. There's got to be a punishment for sin. And thankfully, at the end of that chain, that cycle, God saves. God saves through His Son, Jesus Christ. We have to remember that God is a holy God. And we'd be so thankful that He's not gray. We don't have to guess what is right or wrong because He tells us this is sin and this is what's not sin. <laughs> well, we get to remember that this holy God, that He made us, that He loves us, that He died for us, that He rose from the grave for us, and then He gave us this Word to teach us, to lead us to salvation in Christ. And we got, and that's just as a preface as we get in here, we got three divisions this week, and uh, line them up as the end of chapter 5 through 6, Jericho. God's judgment we see, then chapter 7 and 8, uh, Achan. God's deliver us, and, and then last, chapter 9, Gibeon. Uh, the deception and God's grace. We get to this first division here, and um, so we know we're going to have this battle against the first city, this Jericho, and, and we know right off the bat, and it's just fascinating that we read about that Joshua encounters this man with a drawn sword in hand. 
And he asked this question, which of course we would is natural to us. We're, we think we're about to go into battle. We see somebody there with a sword. Are you with us or for us? Are you, you know, for us or against us? And isn't that fascinating that he answers neither? But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have come. So we see from that to start with, this is God in some form. And we, you know, there's various commentators that say what, what form of God, but he's the commander of the Lord's armies. An angel is not the commander of the Lord's armies. God is the commander of the Lord's armies. And we know that this is God's battle. God is there. And so then this question about, well, whose side, you know, we, we tend to think, well, God's for the good guys and he's against the bad guys. Well, the question is not, is, is God on our side? That's not the right question. The right question is, are we on God's side? And he's making that real clear. And then when he says, he gives that command to take off your sandals for this place where you're standing is holy. Just like happened back in Exodus with Moses, the reason it's holy is because God is there. You know, so he's encountering God, and that's really neat for Joshua to see that, and it's neat for us to see it, because this is God's battle. You know, and then, I, and, and frankly, right here at the beginning is, is, I think, my favorite line of this week's study, when he said, The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. You know, God's declaring it is done. And, and of course, there's so much that's symbolic in these Old Testament books to the New Testament, the new covenant to come with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ declared on the cross, it is done. All right, so we know that our victory in life is certain through Christ, but we also know that we've got some battles that have got to be fought. And the key, of course, is keeping our eye on God as the source of our victory. And I want to mention, guys, just in case, for those of you that don't have and don't have experience with kids upstairs in our children's ministry, that, uh, and you have an opportunity, if you know of a child, your child, grandchild, friend's child, neighborhood child, that this is not just babysitting going on upstairs. That all the kids, basically from first grade all the way through high school, they're studying the same thing we are. they got a lesson that they study. And I, and I, re I thought of that because this week the children's aim is God calls his people to reject sin and rely on him. And that's pretty much applicable to us, too, in exactly what we're studying. That's what we learned this week. But in any event, so God's declared to Joshua, I have delivered, past tense, even before it happens. And it's so cool because you know God's declaring this victory has been won. It means it's his victory, too. Uh, so then we go on to this, the siege and the actual the siege and fall of Jericho. And, you know, here, of course, God is instructing Joshua and the people in the most bizarre way to go about a battle that nobody would ever think of, right? It's, and he's gonna, you're going to circle this city following the horns, but you're going to be silent. And you can imagine him walking around all the way around Jericho in silence. And then God's instructing them one day at a time, just like he's just finished doing out in the desert for 40 years years feeding them one day at a time and so they're trusting God one day at a time you know you, and then you think about that you think that's us that's what God tells us to do right don't worry about tomorrow just worry about today if the worry's got today is enough worry focus on today and what God's calling us to do today so here he is he's doing that uh, and then of course we see the Ark of the Covenant as, as the center of this procession because that is the presence of God and this is God's battle. Um, and then we see that Joshua is, and through the Lord, as Joshua is commanding on two important things. And he commands, when we get in there on the seventh day, we are not going to take a prisoner. Number one. And number two, all of the valuables, the gold, the silver, the loot, is going to, don't keep it, it's going to be delivered to the Lord's treasury. And of course, we all know, we've read the story, and you think, okay, there was, that was it. That was the sign. That was an instruction. And now you think about, all right, God has just commanded his people to go and to kill every person in that place. Of course, except for Rahab and her family. And then that's where we may be that, you know, that we can say, all right, I need, I need to figure this out. That God's calling his people to go and destroy other people. How can this be? Well, we know we started at the beginning. It's sin. God punishes sin. 
and God warns before he ever punishes sin. He warns us before we sin. And we know from the study that these Canaanites, that God gave them plenty of time, 400 years. Right? And all they did was get worse. And we read about they sacrificed kids. They did all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, and even back in Genesis, and, and, and this is where God's telling Abraham, in the fourth generation your descendants will come back here. For the sin of the Amorites and the Ites has not reached its full measure. So we know that that sin continued to escalate. And then I think it's important, and I've got some here from Deuteronomy 7, that just like us, as people today, that we are to obey God, clearly. That he, he ordered them, when the Lord your God brings you into this land you're entering to possess and drive out the nations before you, incidentally, seven nations, all larger and stronger than you, and when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them and show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them. Of course, God instructs, you don't want them to be mixing with your sons and daughters, for they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods, and the Lord's anger will burn against you and will destroy you, quickly destroy you. So these people, the, the God's people are under ex express instruction. And again, the parallels are incredible because it's just like us today. We have a clear rule book, don't we? All right, so you go on, and now they get to day seven, and of course he instructs them, all right, you're, you're going to circle Jericho seven times, and that, when the trumpet's out, you're going to, when the trumpets sound, you're going to shout. Uh, and the parallels there, right? somebody pointed out to me in Revelation, incidentally, you may know this. It says, And I saw seven angels who stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And those seven trumpets of Revelation uh, pronounced these seven judgments against sin in the world. And this is exactly what's happening right here uh, at Jericho. And sure enough, and you just imagine the people inside of Jericho. You know, there, there are warriors in there. They're, they're soldiers. And they're watching this, and, they're, and they know what's happened, and they may be shivering their boots. You know, they're not coming out and attacking the Israelites who are circling them. And then all of a sudden they shout, as commanded, the walls fall, which only God can do. Uh, and then, of course, the people, the Israelite people, follow God's instructions. They go in, they burn the city, they kill everyone in it. It says that, that uh, except for Rahab, which, incidentally, I know we mentioned it last week, but you just cannot skip over. You know, we studied last week that faith without action is dead. Here's Rahab who stepped out in faith, which is what we're called to do. And when we step out in faith in obedience to God, He saves. And He saves Rahab uh, and her whole family. And we know that we learned last week that means that God will, uh, that, uh, that salvation in Christ is available to everyone. Anyone and everyone. Thank God. Um, all right. So uh, we know the story that happens and Joshua uh, curses the place. That Any man who's going to rebuild the city, which incidentally 500 years later, that exact things happen. We'll read about in First King. Uh, it says, so the Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread throughout the land. So we get to the end of our first section here and the, and the principle is that God righteously judges all sin pointing us to salvation in Christ. God righteously judges all sin, pointing all to salvation in Christ. You know, when the, and he asked this question, when, when, when God says in the Bible that all sin will be judged, I want to ask this question, it'll sound kind of weird, but why don't we believe that? I mean, God's already, so far in, in, in the first part of this Bible, proven even in this book, he's got, he stopped the Jordan River. He made the Jericho walls fall. And so it's kind of easy to ask for the non-Christian world out there, why don't you believe it? But I'm pointing to us as Christians. If we, if we truly believe God's going to judge sin as he says and he teaches us here, why is our testimony not bolder out there in the world to lead people to Christ? Why is our, why is our prayer for non-believers not bolder? You know, so we can, we can always turn around and we look and see, why, you know, here's the example. Why, you know, why do the people out there not believe? Well, we can always turn and look at ourselves. Why do I not believe more? Why is my testimony not stronger? And this is exactly why God gives us this word to teach us about his nature, to teach us about his holiness, to teach us about his omnipotent nature, 
so that I can start doing like Rahab and stepping out in faith, sharing that testimony. And why, oh, by the way, you know, what if God did not judge sin? You just think for a second and think, wow, that's a slippery slope. We're because we're in the complete chaos in the world. And we and as we 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 learned last year in Romans, the fact that God promises to judge sin, he's faithful in his promises, means we don't have to worry about that. When there's a wrong against us, we know God's gonna deal with that. And so through that, we're able to obey him to forgive. As it's not our job, it's not our responsibility, it's not our worry, because he's gonna take care of it. And that's that's one of the reasons why it's so uh, peace giving to us to know that ju- God does indeed judge sin. All right, so we move on here in the second division, chapter 7 and 8, and this, this Achan's sin starts off with in chapter 7. You know, we all read, and it says, But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. The Israelites, and we know it was one person. And so you start off the chapter knowing, all right, I, there, God's going to teach us something here. And it says, the Lord's anger burned against Israel. You know, and of course, we get to read that right now, and Joshua doesn't know it. And we know the people, they said, oh, next battle, AI, and isn't this just like us to get ahead of God? God blesses us in some way, and we get to thinking, man, I'm invincible. And so here they say, oh, we just send a few guys down there. We just crushed Jericho. Did you see that? The walls fell. And sure enough, they don't consult God, go down there, and they get routed. All right? Get routed. Now, and again, you know, we're, we're guilty of that all the time, but we're, we, we know the lesson there to seek God. But then it says that this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. You know, and, and isn't that like us? To just temporary obstacles pop up and we say, oh, gosh, God, well, you know, we just lose faith, you know, and God it says, hey, it's just temporary. you got to battle him, but you have to rely on me. And then I'll tell you guys, this prayer that Joshua has, that he tore his clothes and he laid down prone to the Lord, and, and he's saying, God, you know, why did you bring us across the river? And, and the first time I read, and I'm going to confess, the first time I read through this, I said, gosh, Joshua, you're folding like a cheap suit like everybody else here. <laughs> but then the more I got to, and then you see, by the way, God answers that prayer. And then I go back and I'm reading it some more and I'm studying about it and say, wait a minute. This is actually, you know, Joshua, and there's, a, and there's a neat part in the notes. There's a section this week, you'll see, prayer when disappointed. And it shows us how Joshua's prayer is such a model. You know, so often we don't, you know, gosh, I don't, I don't want to go grumble to God about what's going on, or I don't want to talk to him about, you know, maybe it's going to sound like I'm complaining. And here it is, Joshua, he lays out all his concerns with God. And he comes humbly, reverently, on his face. He leads other people to seek the Lord. And in the end, the last part of it, Joshua prayed with passion for God's honor in the world. You remember that? He's saying, God, how will you be honored if this happens? And what would it be like if we prayed like that? If we prayed humbly and we we lay it before God because we know God, Jesus says, I will carry your burden, right? And so he wants us to come to him. He wants us to draw closer to him. And when we're in the tough times, that's when he really wants us to draw us in. Because that's when he can lift us up. So I was humbled myself by, of course, my judgment. And, of course, it's a good thing I'm not the judge and God's the judge. So I learned there from Joshua. And the bottom line here is that, you know, he's teaching us just as, uh, as Joshua did. God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we should never think because tough times are going on, somehow he's left me. He taught us he will never leave us nor forsake us. And then, of course, God's uh, answer to Joshua said, stand up. He said, Israel has sinned. They violated my covenant. And that's why uh, the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. And why did God speak of this, of Israel's sin when it was just one man who stole the loot? You know, part of it is we get to see how sin is infectious. It goes far beyond just the, the individual person. You know, when God chose a people, his people, and not just this, this one person. Um, you know, our uh, former teaching leader, 
Drew, you guys heard many times, and he said it applies right here, that sin always takes us farther than we want to go, keeps us longer than we want to stay, and costs us more than we want to spend. And you, we ask this, this question, how is our sin affecting other people around us? You know, because it always affects it more than just us. And sin deceives us too. Same way that Adam and Eve were tricked by the serpent in the Garden of Eden. You know, the enemy, he is a hunter of men. And he is tricky. He's deceitful. He lays traps for us. He didn't just come up with a billboard and say, hey, come have some sin, right? You know, we'd run from that. But he's tricky. And so we have to be real careful about sin. We've we got to have our fresh eyes that we learn from growing close to God so we recognize sin and say, oh, wait a minute. I know what you're doing, devil. I see that. That's sin. I'm not going there. And we, and, that's, and we have to have those fresh eyes. And Achan sin also shows us that we cannot hide sin from God, right? You know, uh, he's, and incidentally, we, we move forward and, and Achan's called out. He confesses, but he shows no sign of a changed heart. And as a result, he and his family and flock are put to death. Same as the people of Jericho. They make themselves an enemy of God, that their sin will be judged by God. Uh, but thankfully, then it says the Lord turned from his fierce angle because there was a payment for sin, uh, and and the Lord directed Joshua right in this ambush and said, "All right, Joshua, now let's do it my way. And when we do it God's way, it's it we route them instead of us being routed." And so, uh, and in the need, by the way. The exception, the difference from the attack on Jericho is God says that this time all the people of Israel can keep all the livestock and all the valuables. And isn't that funny? You know, I, we learn there's this, there's this wonderful chapter in Matthew, chapter 6, where Jesus is teaching about, I know you worry about what you're going to eat, what you, you know, and that's to us today, it's money, right? How much am I going to get my retirement account? And he says, seek first his righteousness and his kingdom, and God will provide that. And sure enough, that's exactly what he did here. For all those Israelites, except for Achan, who did obey God, he, God took care of them, just like he promises us today. Uh, and then, of course, this, this covenant renewal at Mount uh, Ebal. It's cool that, that he built the temple on the Mount Ebal, just like Moses had commanded. Uh, and then you get to see, and the people are worshiping, this in, what I'm going to say is this incredible span in dichotomy of God. You know, on the one hand, God, he's this perfect, just judge. He judges all sin equally. There's no gray, it's black and white. And on the other end, he's this incredibly gracious God that he would come down to rebellious people and die on the cross for us. That's God all in one. And of course, they finish with Joshua reading the law, every single word to all the people. What a blessing, what a blessing that can be for us today, for our families. The principle is that God is a just judge and a gracious Savior all in one. God is a just judge and a gracious Savior all in one. You know, I ask this uh, one question here before we go on. I mean, it sounds a little pithy, but it's applicable. What sin are you attempting to hide under your tent, like Achan? What sin is it that we have going on that we think, well, nobody knows about it, and we know God knows about it? And it's cool, by the way. Uh, well, let me let me let me move forward, guys. We'll get into this third division. Try to get you out of here close to on time. That Gibeon, God's grace. In short. It says at the beginning when all the kings west of the Jordan heard about these things, that they got what, what it was going on with God's people, that they gathered together all of the, call them the ites, these kings, they came together to wage war against Joshua and Israel. And what, what a picture that is of the world. You know, a world is either for God or they're against God. And we see that again, and we will see it again in Revelation at the end. If all the people that are not God's people... The enemy bands them together to fight against God. Except for these Gibeonites. And this is kind of a fun sentence to say that they resorted to a ruse. 
And they did. It said the Israel, and then of course they came, and they looked like they had been out in the traveling the desert forever. And it says that the Israelites sampled their provisions. I guess they tried the crusty bread. They tried to get a drink of water out of the the old water bags. And the key was, but they did not inquire of the Lord. And that's a key to us, isn't it? Every single day, when we do not inquire of the Lord, you know we're in trouble. Uh, and then Joshua and the leaders made this peace, and they made an oath to God. And so then, they, of course, they discover we've been deceived, and, and, they, and it's kind of funny. It says they all go running up to, to, to Gibeon, but they don't attack because they can't because they made this oath to God, and I don't know why they ran up there, but they did. And they want to confront them, right? And, of course, they do confront them. And why did you do this? And here it is, the Gibeonites say, you know, your servants, we were clearly told how the Lord your God has commanded his servant Moses to give you the whole land and to wipe out all the inhabitants. That's us. So we feared for our lives. And so they submitted, uh, of course, to God's people. And Joshua, and isn't it cool that they ended up giving the Gibeonites this punishment. They show them grace. They feared God. They came to God's people instead of away from him. And they gave him this service that to, to be wood gatherers and, and, and cutters in the service of the altar. So they ended up in a job that's going to bring them closer to God all the time. It's just really cool that they're the ones that feared him. And then the principle I've got up here is that God is gracious to all who fear and seek him. God is gracious to all who fear and seek him. You know what, what makes a person give their life to Jesus Christ? We know that there's a work of God to open up our hearts to have faith. But to get there intellectually, emotionally, the reality of eternal condemnation of hell is a serious thing, right? And it's not talked about enough in the world today at all, hardly, right? But that's part of God's law. And it says Joshua read every single word to the people. We read every single word and then we learn this is the most serious of matters, right? And that's what we need to know about. But isn't it gracious, too, that God gives us His Word to lead us to this salvation that He gives us? You know, and uh, we go back to whatever that sin is that you're you know, trying to hide under the tent. We've all got it. You know, we learn here this week to ask God to change our heart, like God's people did there, and He will. Ask God to give you strength, and He will. Ask God to forgive you, and we know that he will through Jesus Christ. And if you ask God, as Joshua did, to make God's name, God's glory, the priority in whatever it is you're doing, that God will do that. And when he's glorified, we're fulfilled. We might be shocked by how fiercely God judges sin. The world might be shocked by it. But what's far more shocking every time is how gracious God would be to forgive a bunch of sinners like us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word this week. We thank you that you do judge sin, so we don't have to worry about it being judged. But we thank you for being black and white, for not being gray, for teaching us the one way, the only way, and the greatest way to you, Lord, is through your son, Jesus Christ, through faith in you. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your gift to us, Lord. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a great week.